Awesome. Well, today I'm going to be talking about something that I hope um, a decent amount of you are familiar with, uh, and that's sparse distributed memory. Uh, I have my copy right next to me. Uh, but this was a book that I was actually pointed to by the like one of the original Numenta papers. I forgot which one, but it was uh, a while ago, and it was I think one of the first references listed. And so I picked it up. Ended up being just a fantastic read, um, and got somewhat technical. Um, but had some very interesting insights and, and formed sort of a, a nice mathematical model of memory. Um, and I thought it was super useful for a few reasons. Um, but uh, yeah, so let's get into it. Um, right, so I'm going to talk about a few things. So first off uh, are some concepts related to high dimensional vectors. Again, I think uh, a lot of us should be familiar with these, but I think it's important to keep revisiting these uh, sort of high dimensional vector concepts because they're just very important um, and just very unintuitive because we, we live in a three dimensional world and we just have a really hard time thinking about a thousand or 10,000 dimensional spaces. Um, then I'm gonna talk about the actual model and then further extensions. Um, so starting out with something uh, reasonably simple, we're gonna define the space of vectors of, uh, and we just label it zero one to the N um, in the book, n is of dimension, I think, 1,000. Um, and so each you know, binary vector will look like just a string of ones and zeros. And of course, there's going to be n, capital N, uh, equals 2 to the power of lowercase n, which is the number of you know, bits in the uh, vector. Um, and so this is a very large space. It gets very large very quickly. It's exponential in the size of the address. Um, and we can define an important point as the origin, and I denote that as O throughout the rest of the presentation. And that's just the zero vector. It's just, in this case, a thousand zeros. Um, and one thing that's really nice is that the space has rotational symmetry. So if we're comparing two different points, we can just run, rotate one point back to the origin. Um, one way that you can do that is with the XOR operation. Um, so just review of what the XOR operation is. This is when, uh, if you're XORing X and Y, so X would be this 0101 and Y would be this bottom 0011, then the XOR operation of X and Y would be ones at the bits at which X and Y differ. Um, and so when you XOR one vector with another vector, it tells you how to rotate one vector to get to the other. Uh, that's that's kind of the idea here. Um, right. Can you, so, before, before you go yeah. on, Alex, um, so I'm very familiar with this book. I've read it multiple times, but not in a long time. Um, and, the, and I don't understand this slide. Um, so I just, I don't know if it's important for me to understand or not. Um, so rotational symmetry, um, concept, familiar with the concept of symmetry, different types of symmetry. I'm not sure exactly what you mean by rotational symmetry in this case. Right. Um, what does that mean? Yeah, so it means that you can, uh, so, so what I'm building up to is the idea that distance does not depend on where you are. So um, I'll get I'll get to this in a few slides, and I think the sort of motivation behind this rotational symmetry will be easier when I talk about distance. But if you're taking the distance between the point and the origin, it's the same as taking. Uh, basically, if you're if you want to take the distance between two random points, you can rotate one of them back to the origin and take the distance from the origin to the rotated point. You say rotate it back to the origin. So uh, that's the part I'm confused about. Um, yeah, um, so <laughs> I, I guess the, re the reason I, uh, I keep saying rotate is because I one way to think about this space is as a hypercube of like a thousand dimensions. Yes. And so then uh, you can take the points on a cube and just uh, and rotate them and like remap them in like a, in a rotation. Well, so I imagine this is a three dimensional cube. All right, let's go okay. three dimensions so we can visualize it. Yeah. So I'm not sure what you mean by rotate. So I'll say I take one of the points on that three-dimensional cube. Mm -hmm. uh, what does it mean to rotate? Am I, um, am I yeah. I'm still you confused think, by that? You can, you can think about a physical rotation. Uh, yeah, like I'm trying. Think, yeah. Uh, so yeah, if you have your cube, just rotate it in your mind. Uh, so, so say you have like, uh, Man, this is really hard to, to talk about. This. Are you saying you're saying maybe make that make a point the origin, and then I can I can I can rotate a cube. I, I can imagine a cube. I can take any point point on a three dimensional cube, 
and mm -hmm. I can and sort of rotate the cube around that point, and it'll be it'll become lined up again in a little bit. Is that what is that what you mean? I'm, I'm confused, it's, but... the, the idea, yeah. So the idea of rotation really is in handy when you're talking about multiple points, so two points, so or even you know three or four points. If you rotate the entire cube, nothing is going to happen that changes the actual relationship between those points. Yes. So that that's like the idea here is that. So I can, no, but I can say, okay, so you can say you take one of those points, make it the origin. Mm -hmm. Yep. But but now, of course, when I do that, the, the all the other points are changing their addresses too, right? So yes, that's so, right. But the so, distance to those addresses are the same. So so are you saying the XOR operation allows uh, uh, if I apply if I apply an X the same XOR operation to both points, are you saying then the distance doesn't change? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, okay, I got okay. I got that. That's simple. All right. Yeah. So basically, what you're saying, the, the concept here, I know you're going with the concept about the distance to these points and how interesting that is. But but you're saying here, if I have two points, if I apply XR operation to one of them that gives me all zeros, then the distance is is just the number of ones in the other one. Something. Like yeah, that. that's exactly right. That was, that's okay. Like it took me a while to figure out what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I I, I, I I think that you're looking for rather than rotational symmetry is rotational invariance. That that's probably a better. Yeah, that's that's a way of saying it. Yeah. All right. uh, thank you. Yeah. So this is exactly what you just said, Jeff. This is the uh, <laughs> this is the less confusing way of talking about it. But the XOR is the XOR between two vectors gives you the rotation that you would apply uh, to get from one to the other. Did Penta use that term rotation? In yeah. The he yeah. Did. I don't remember. Okay. Um, All right. Yeah, this isn't like super important, uh, but it's it's easier to think about comparing an origin and another point as opposed to comparing two random points. Um, that that's kind of the whole reason behind this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, not that's not. I guess I just internalized it where I just I don't think about this origin idea. You can just yeah. you can just do, you can just basically do the XOR between these things and you figure out the distance. Yeah, so, that's so, so that, that would have been the simple way to put it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so the distance is what you're really computing here is the Hamming distance. That's exactly right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. This is the Hamming distance. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So here's the two ways that I think about this space. Um, so on the left, you'll see just a, a nice planar representation where you have this long, just large two-dimensional plane. Um, and it's, it doesn't extend infinitely out in all directions because there's a finite number of points and it actually kind of wraps back around on itself, um, which is why I have this this operation here where you wrap the you wrap the space around like a ball, um, and that's that leads to this over here. And there's a specific reason why I chose this thing instead of a regular ball, and it's because these sort of rubber spikes are like sort of discrete points on the space, and you could imagine that each spike has like an opposite spike on the other side. Um, and so this is just to say that you can think about this space as a big sort of discrete ball of points on the sort of outside of a hypersphere uh, as an approximation, or as like this planar representation, uh, which will be helpful when thinking about things like the radius around a point. Um, that's all this slide is supposed to explain. And then Hamming distance becomes like the Manhattan distance on, on, this, uh, on this planar representation. Um, Right, so then you can ask how many points are of distance d away from a point uh, from from the origin, right? And again, since any point can be rotated to the origin, this this applies to all points, um, and that's just a binomial coefficient. So if you have all the points that are exactly one bit away, it's all the places where you have uh, it's all the vectors on which one bit is on uh, compared to the origin. So that's a thousand, and when n is equal to a thousand, and then for two, it's 1,000 choose two, and so on. Um, and then the distribution for the distance between random points and the origin. So you have your whole space, you start at your origin, and you just pick a random point. And what is the distribution of the distance uh, between that random point and the origin? And that is equal, it's basically equal to the binomial coefficient of, uh, of the, the distance over two to the n, uh, because all of these points are equally weighted, right? So the probability in, in the book, the probability of ones and zeros in this space are exactly equal. So there's 50% ones, 50% zeros. This term just collapses down to 0 0.5 to the n. 
Okay. And so then, yeah, this is the, again, the, the same point I was trying to make is that the distribution, the distribution for the distance between two random points is going to be the same because you just rotate one point to the origin and your, the rotation preserves distance. Okay. So then now we can start looking at this graphically. Um, this is the distribution of distances for high dimensional vectors. You can imagine, uh, instead of talking about, you know, random points and distances from the origin, it's just flipping coins, right? Uh, it's the same sort of, it's this binomial distribution. So you can say, well, the number of points that are exactly, uh, you know, one bit away from the origin is the same as the number of times that you'll get exactly one head in a thousand coin flips. Um, so that's just why I put that there. And the important thing here is that as you increase your dimensionality, uh, the sort of proportion or the, the, cent, uh, the sort of meat of the distribution gets more and more centered around the mean. Uh, just to explain this x-axis here, this is just normalized so that they subtract off the average and then divide by the average so that you can compare all the different uh, sort of dimensionalities of, of the binomial distribution. Otherwise, they'd be centered at like 1, 4, 16, and 64. So now they're all means, uh, they're all centered at zero. Um, but you can imagine as you take n to really high numbers, it's extremely flat all the way up until you get very close to the, to the mean at which it spikes up to an extraordinarily high number and then goes back down. Um, and that's because you're exponentially increasing the probability density as you get closer and closer to the mean and then exponentially decaying further out. Um, and so you can take a circle around a point um, and I have to note that here. So you have your origin, you have a radius R, you have a point P, and you want to know, okay, how many points are in this entire circle? So that's the number of points that are distance one away in a little circle there, distance two away, distance three away, up to distance R away. And that is the same as taking an integral under this probability distribution uh, going from the origin here all the way out to this point over here, or this is all points that are distance R away, not just point P. Um, and so that's, that's that integral. And so for something like n equals 10,000, if you have this r is equal to 4,700 bits, so it's 40%, 47 percent of the addresses uh, is ones, right? How much of the space does that take up? Uh, and this is where our intuition breaks down because the answer is this number. It's eight zeros and then a one. Um, and it's just an extraordinarily small amount. Um, and that you can, you can imagine that that's sort of corresponding to this black curve, but even more steep, where all this probability distribution down here is basically negligible. And then uh, most of the points are just exactly, or not exactly, but uh, very close to the mean away. Um, so th this is the, the key property that sparse distributed memory relies on, is that these random vectors are going to be just about orthogonal or exactly sort of the mean distance, expected distance away. Um, yeah, and going back to this, this ball here, one way to think about it is that if you pick your point, you know, the origin point on top, then the distribution of these uh, sort of rubber spiky things is not going to be equally distributed around the ball. Most of them are going to be on the equator, right? So you have a very sparse amount of points that are close to your point on the top of the ball. And then as you get closer and closer to the equator, it just grows exponentially. So it's extremely like dense in terms of uh, the orthogonal vectors right at the equator and very sparse as you get close to uh, the origin. And that's true for all points. Okay, so now let's move on to the sort of motivating problem behind sparse distributed memory. Yeah, um, I'll just, I'll just, I think, this, did everyone understand that completely? I mean, these are important points. I just, yeah. I just don't know. Yeah, I, I, I think rather than think about the equator, think about any great circle that passes through that, uh, through that point. So it's, it's not like privileged uh, orientationally, right? Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think about it a totally different way. And so I, I don't want to burden people with my way of thinking about it if everyone understands it this way. So, um, <laughs> I mean, when I read Penny's book the first time, I had to go through all this math and I, it was, I found it very confusing. And in the end, it seemed very, very simple. And it goes back to your, your coin toss example. Mm -hmm. You can say, I'm going to toss my, you know, I'm going to, to uh, toss my coin a thousand times or ten thousand times, and the question is how many times you know what's how many ones you're going to get and how many zeros you're going to get. 
And it's always going to be very, very close to, you know, 500 out of a thousand times you're going to get heads. And it's, that's intuitively obvious. Mm -hmm. That's basically this, what this whole thing is about. I mean, mm -hmm. it's basically <laughs> it's what it is. And, um, and, and the number of 20 times you get, the closer and closer it gets to being, you know, very close to that uh, mean number of flips, average number of flips. So it's, if it's close, it's I mean, obviously everyone else. I find the math non-intuitive to think about it these ways. Even the circle thing is non-intuitive to me. Um, but it's good. Okay, well, maybe it's obvious to everyone else. That's definitely the right way of thinking about it. Um, I mean, is yeah, yeah. That's the main idea. Is that yeah? I mean, it's all kind of building up to this idea of the distribution. If you have like a picture of this distribution in your head. Yeah, this was this this figure here was the key figure. I mean, after reading that book a hundred hundred times, it seems like you know I said that's the thing you had to remember. Yeah. <laughs> and, exactly. uh, yeah. Of course, it's it's worth pointing out again, as we've done in the past. Even though these are he uses the word sparse and distributed, it's not the same sparse and distributed we're talking about. He's right. using dense representations here. He's doing you know fifty percent ones and fifty percent zeros, mm -hmm. and that's not a sparse representation. So he's, he's, we're talking about these high dimensional vectors and the properties they have, but we're not talking about sparse high dimensional vectors, which is what the brain uses. And, yep. and he, he uses the word sparse here. I assume you get to this to talk about the, the memory allocation, but um, just- It's also again, worth pointing out. Yeah, it's also worth pointing out that some of the operations that we use are quite different. And so Hamming distance, for example, is not a good distance metric, I think, mm -hmm. for these scenarios and particularly at least the way we did it in HTM. Right. Um, and so, you know, dot products or overlap is a much better distance metric and it has somewhat, it's somewhat different. You, you get some, uh, some of these kind of same intuitions show up, but it is a very different set of operations. So it's worth kind of keeping that in mind as well. Yeah, definitely. I was gonna, yeah, at the end of the presentation, um, after I talk about SDM, I'll talk about uh, some improvements that other people have made and proposals um, that work on sparse uh, representations as well. Um, so you can have a spark. Yeah. There, there's like several different kinds of sparsity going on here. Um, but yeah, what I, I knew, um, sort of the, the Numenta SDR framework does not map onto this dense, this dense vector. So, um, there are proposals to use sparse vectors, um, as a, as a address in addition to the sparse memory component. Um, but yeah, that's a distinction. I think it'll be easier to make after I introduce the, the sparse memory concept. Um, right, so this is sort of a very basic overview of uh, the, the best match problem is uh, if you have a bunch of things to store in your memory, uh, we'll say those are called uh, these, these words G, right? So say you, you store this handwritten digit one in your memory and then two and then three, you want to be able to recover these given something that's you know somewhat similar. So if you have a corrupted version or a poorly drawn version of a one, then hypothetically you should be able to recover the original stored memory that's that's closest to it. Um, so this is this would be the audio the audio the auto associated memory uh, function. And so a way of thinking about that is, well, if you have this one is a point, and you store it at uh, so you store this piece of data, this one, at itself as the address. You use this as the address and the data at that address. Then if you uh, are given a point within a certain radius of that address, right? So maybe this one, since it's similar, will end up in a similar point in that space. You should be able to recover this one um, without trying to recover anything else. This is a pretty tough problem. Um, but... Uh, so one thing, there's a, there's a chapter in the book that basically goes over the idea of neurons as address decoders. And the reason for this is that it, it, it's kind of motivated by this original formulation of neurons as sort of uh, weighted, uh, a weighted sum of its inputs with an activation function. And so in this case, it's the inputs are equally probable ones and zeros. The weights are plus and minus one. And then the... Uh, activation function is just a step function. So as, if it's over a certain threshold, you can imagine the neuron firing, if it's below, it doesn't fire. Um, and that's what the activation is. Um, and so if you think about the weights actually correspond to a specific address in the input space. So if you have an input 
there's going to be one, exactly one input that maximally excites this neuron given its weights. So the weights actually parameterize an address for the neuron. Uh, and that you can see here. So if your neuron has weights uh, at this at the screen point, or yeah, the weights correspond to the screen point, you can decrease the threshold for your neuron's activation. And that correspondingly increases the radius at which it will fire. So if you're given an address here, your neuron will fire. Um, if the, yeah, if the radius is, is large enough. Um, right. Let's see. So here is where the concept of sparsity in sparse distributed memory comes up. And that's that if you have a thousand dimensional space, that means there's two to the 1000 possible addresses. That is just astronomically large, much larger than the number of atoms in the universe and whatnot. And you only have a million neurons. And those neurons are randomly distributed throughout, distributed throughout the space. And this is actually not even, this is again an impoverished view of a thousand dimensional space because they'd be, it's really hard to visualize something that's, all of these are kind of equally equidistant apart. Um, but the idea is that it's sparse in the number of neurons compared to the size of the space, not necessarily the, the address space. The address space is still dense in terms of the ones and zeros that make up each address. Um, but we'll continue um, continuing on from here. Uh, quick look, quick question, Alex. Yeah, yeah, what's up? Um, so if you, so the, the location of the neuron is like the, is that the point that like maximally excites yep. it basically? Yep, that's exactly right, yeah. And then each of these neurons has its own sort of radius. And in the book, the radius of all these neurons, their, their activation radius is the same. You tune it so that all of them have a certain like radius at which they're activated. Well, if you just randomly pick them, they'll be about the same. Yep. Right. Yeah. That's the point of that graph, really. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. And again, these these neurons are randomly distributed. So um, there's no. It's just you know, if you want to pick a neuron's weights, you just you just uh, you know, flip a coin again for plus and minus one for each input dimension. Um, so that's that's also interesting. Um, the, the neurons are, it, yeah, uh, not only are the addresses dense, but the, the weights are dense too, in the sense that it's all plus and minus one. There's no zeros. Each neuron uh, has a plus and minus one for every single input. So it has to look at the entire address to figure out if it's going to fire. Okay, so what does writing entail? Um, so let's say you want to write a piece of data to an address. Um, so what you do is you Take your data, let's say it's a one, right? This, this handwritten digit of a one and WT, let's let WT correspond to the address of, of, this, of this one, right? So let's imagine that this one was represented as a, a string of a thousand ones and zeros. That's what WT is right here. Now WT does not correspond to any sort of neuron actually in this population, right? It's just, it'll be a random point in the blue. Um, and the operation that you're going to, to do here is you're going to add the data to all of the neurons in this right circle, right? So uh, you're, you're going to activate all the neurons within a certain radius of that point. And all those activated neurons will have this data added to a multi-set. So I'll get to exactly how neurons can have a multi-set of data uh, in a bit, because that, that feels like a really weird thing. You, uh, just because that, that, that seems extremely implausible. Um, but you'll see in just a second that um, there's ways to get around the idea of like actually storing a giant multi-set. But um, so you're here and you add this one to the set of data at all these other neurons. And you can see there's a two here as well because this is, uh, an, a, it's a, it's a multi-set. So uh, there can be repeats of ones. There can be uh, other pieces of data written to the neurons. Um, this, this two is not in this access set, so it's not getting written to. Um, but yeah, you're going to be writing to each of these uh, sort of e each of the neurons that you're within a certain radius of. And those are actually called hard locations in the paper, uh, or not in the paper, in the, in the book. Um, so the number of such neurons should be pretty small, right? Because yeah. most of them are not going to be anywhere close to that right. uh, so, target neuron. Yep. And um, you, it, the, the numbers chosen in the book, again, can be varied, but you can choose the number 
of neurons, the expected number that you want to be activated by any given location. So you can say, well, I want exactly 0 0.001 hard locations to be activated when I write to any given address. And so that then you use uh, to that probably the binomial distribution to figure out what the R value should be, how, how far this radius should be to activate on average uh, one thousandth of the hard locations. So one thousandth of the hard locations would be one million times one over one thousand, which is just one thousand neurons. And um, then uh, let's see. Yeah, so you're adding this new data to each of the neurons multiset, which is actually like a thousand write operations. If there's a thousand hard locations that are activated, uh, then it's a, that's a lot of write operations. Um, it's one per neuron in the access circle. So this is where you get a hint of the sort of distributed nature of, these, of the memory model. Okay, so then what does reading entail? How do you read from your memory once you've written to it? Um, so again, you use your data as your address. And remember this time it's gonna be different because it's, it's not the, the one that we stored, it's a new one that should hopefully get us back to this original memory point that we stored. So we have this new corrupted version of, of one and we get the access overlap, which is just this, uh, you know, the thousand neurons that are within a certain radius. And then you combine all of the entries from all of the neurons that are activated in this circle, right? And so on average, if 10,000 words are stored in the memory, again, this is a variable number, but if 10,000 words are stored in this memory, then each neuron should be responsible for about 10 different words. So then when you pool, a thousand, uh, a thousand neurons times ten words. That's ten thousand entries, and then for all these entries, you take the bitwise average. So that would be taking, in this case, it would be like overlaying this one and this one and this three, and putting them all on top of each other and taking the average, and then uh, you can round up or down to like a, a zero or a one, um, and that gets you the output of the model, right? Um, and the, I'm, I'm leaving a bunch out here in terms of uh, like, the, the, uh, Penty goes through a few other sort of attempts at making this work beforehand. And this is motivated by solving the issues that come up in, in sort of previous attempts. Um, but yeah, that's just a, a disclaimer there. Um, but I should highlight one of the intuitive reasons why this should work is that if you're reading from here, uh, from this, location of the corrupted one, then you're going to get some overlap with these neurons that also have the actual data you want to recover. And you're going to have a bunch of other hard locations that are giving you a bunch of sort of random noise. And these hard location neurons that you're reading from are sort of sufficiently far apart that all of their sort of data is going to be extremely decorrelated such that you're basically getting the average of a bunch of random noise. So you're not going to be getting, um, you know, three different copies of this three in here. Otherwise, uh, you'd expect that this address that you're at would be closer to a three than to an actual one. Uh, so yeah, you're, you're reading from a bunch of decorrelated de multisets and then taking the bitwise average. And so the signal coming from here should overpower the noise coming from the uh, decorrelated neurons. So I have a question on on this. So let's suppose your space is a thousand bit vector mm -hmm. and you say, okay, I've got this address. I want to query to see, uh, to kind of collect all the guys who are within uh, distance one of me. Mm -hmm. So that means you got to query a thousand locations. You, you, you take each of the address bits, flip it by one and test to see if something is actually there. Is that how, and then uh, then you just, uh, for those that are there, then you collect their inputs. Is that how this is working? Yep, that's exactly right. Okay, so that's slow. Yeah. So are we gonna get to something that has a practical implementation? Well, yeah, I mean, the idea is that it's a lot, it's a lot of operations. So yeah, so it's two, uh, yeah, I'll go on to the next slide. It's a lot of operations. But um, so part of it can be sped up by the fact that you're storing a running average instead of a bunch of actual multi sets. Um, and then the other part of it is that it's supposed to be done in parallel. 
So um, even though it's a lot of operations, they can all happen at the exact same time. And that's, that's kind of how you get to sort of a, a faster implementation. Um, yeah, does that? I, so I'm, 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 let me, let me just take you back a second there. If, if basically I've got a space that each address is a thousand bits in, mm -hmm. okay. Um, so you, you've got to have some way of compressing that space. Otherwise, uh, that's an exponential, that's a hugely exponential space. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that the space is actually represented as a, as a matrix, which only contains those locations, which actually are active. Yeah, that that's this picture here on the right. Okay. So if that's the case and you want to add an extra location to the thing, that means you've and is are those locations in any kind of order right now in the contents matrix? Mm, no, I, I mean, yeah, it's all it's all pretty much just random locations, random order. Uh, I okay. don't think he's really so. Concerned so if with, you want to, uh, you know, yeah, I don't think he's not, really concerned with. It's not an implementation book; it's a mathematical book. I don't think he's really concerned about implementation issues. Well, that's right. I, I kind of am. <laughs> no. Well, I, yeah, but, uh, I know, but I don't think we should take this too literally. This is, uh, you know, 20, 30 years old or whatever. Um, more than that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think anyone would do this today. So I wouldn't. Yeah, I, I, it, I think it was you have a, to kind of take, get yourself away from implementation. It was a theory no one would actually paper. Implement it. it was a yeah, theory, a theory paper, paper. A theory monograph and, and, and introducing concepts that were really useful. And again, I, I'm, I'm with Super Time, this one, Kevin needs. He wasn't thinking about building this or anything. You know, that wasn't the point. Well, um, yeah, I, I mean, I mean, Hilbert spaces are great theoretical concepts, but you don't want to implement anything in them. So that's that's why I'm I'm just kind of looking to see. This is like a discrete version of a Hilbert space. So, okay, I'll 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 back off of it. It's I, I'm I'm going down here and just kind of trying to figure out you know how I would actually. Uh, you're trying yeah. to build this, but <laughs> well, was not, or, or something that's the moral equi equivalent of it. I mean, Penty was not interested in building anything. This... <laughs> he was not interested in building anything. I know. So, all right. I mean, the uh, intuitions you get from this are very, very important. I mean, the intuitions from that earlier chart about the the distance of the points in a high dimensional space are, are fundamental to the work we did and we're doing. Um, I mean, this is the, you know, this is the first, for me, this is the first interesting thing I read about frames. It wasn't even a book about frames, but it was talking about, um, talking about properties of, of spaces, which are very useful. So I think that's what we want to walk away from is this, to get this intuitions about these high dimensional spaces. And, and those intuitions change well, when those spaces that become the brain sparse. Is an <laughs> To, to the extent that the brain is an implementation of some mapping of this, you know, it's not. Well, that's, that's, that's it, my it's point. Not, it's, no, it's, it's not. It's not right. These are dense addresses. We don't have that in the brain. We have sparse addresses. And yeah, I mean, and, if you want to look at mappings to brain, I think you should look at SDRs. Yes, um, exactly. That's this, that's where that this, came from. I mean, I, I, I don't want to take away from this. It's a very influential book for me too. The point was, in the end, the thing I walked away with was that one intuition about. Uh, distances in high dimensional spaces. And that's the only part we actually needed to really understand the, the SDRs and all that other stuff. Um, so uh, the rest of it doesn't really pertain to uh, to brains or our work, but it's still interesting. So I think it's, it's interesting that Alex is going through it. Yeah. Could I, could I also, make the, could I, yeah. I'm sorry, could I make the generalization that SDRs takes this concept and then applies some additional constraints to it to, to make it into something that realizes. I, I don't even think that's right. To me, it maybe it maybe someone else will disagree with me. The whole concept of memory in this space is different than the memory concepts I think about in the brain and SDRs and so on. It's really just the mathematical properties of high dimensional spaces, which are the, the, the key item. But the way these memories work, I don't I never have tried to correlate Penty's sparse distributed memory system. Because it's based on having these very, very, very large, dense um, address spaces, and and then the sparse is because you're only populating a certain, a small number of the address space potential address spaces. Um, I don't. That, I've never, never thought about the brain and SDRs. Any of our work like that at all? Maybe, maybe there is a correlation, but, but I don't think that's useful to think of it that way. 
Um, it's really just a useful thing like, oh, shit, shit these high dimensional spaces are very unintuitive. <laughs> and, and and you can you can basically just, just walk away saying, oh, I have a high dimensional space and, um, um, and, and if in, in bits get corrupted, I'm, yeah, I'm still going to be. I'm still going to get the right answer. <laughs> so, um, okay. Something like that. Yeah, I, 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 I guess so. I think I, the, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm I think sorry. the intuitions are what's really important here. And uh, just as Jeff mentioned, the the distances in high dimensional spaces can be very, very have very non-intuitive properties, and those properties can be extremely powerful. That's really the takeaway from this book. Um, and that now you can apply that intuition. Okay. Given that thing, how do we now compute, deal with dimensionality in other contexts? And you can look at SDRs and try to do it, but I don't think you can, it's easy to take the literally what he's doing and sort of try to convert it to, a, I don't think that's helpful. I think the intuitions are what's yeah. really helpful. And, um, and you know, yeah, noise I was hoping the guy was developing uh, an algebra to, to work with this stuff. And, and but, if, but if there's no way of actually mapping it to well, I don't think I don't think we then. yeah I don't think we want to do that. It's it's just not. The yeah, way. I mean there yeah. might be some contorted way of doing it. I don't think it's helpful. Um, I think the intuitions that Pente came up with are super important and really fundamental. Um, and those intuitions can apply in a lot of different contexts. I think with high dimensions. Yeah, actually, if I might interject here, I think the um, so I mean yeah I agree. One of the my biggest gripe with this whole thing was the dense addresses. Um, but I'll talk about later that that's actually kind of completely separable from the idea of the sparse distributed memory and you can use sparse addresses. You can also use SDRs. I'm pretty sure. Um, so well, he, he didn't do that. And no, he definitely he, did. And he, he resisted doing that as far as I've known him. <laughs> so, oh, <right. laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, there's, there's follow-up work, which, which goes more in that direction. Uh, but he, yeah, his, his work, I think stopped at the dense addresses. Um, okay, so yeah, I think maybe it, it's worth spending a, a little bit of time explaining what's actually going on in this picture here and how this maps onto what I was talking about earlier. Um, so if you have an address that's coming in, let, let's, let's pretend that this is a write operation. So you have an address coming in uh, and this address will selectively activate some neurons uh, which are at these hard locations based on their, uh, their sort of addresses, right? The, some neurons are going to be very close to this input address and some neurons are gonna be far away and you're going to activate the ones that are very close, right? And very close in this sense actually means just uh, the neurons that are closer than 447 bits away, which is like pretty large. I mean, if you have a, a thousand bits, that just means they have to share, you know, 40, 44.7%. Uh, no, less than that. It, basically, this is a very large radius. That's what I'm trying to say here. So the Hamming distances are distributed very much around 500. And as soon as you stray, you know, more than 50 something away from that median Hamming distance, then you activate these neurons. So that's what this Y vector is. So these are all the activated hard locations and all these activated hard locations then are connected to uh, sort of another sort of set of synapses that synapse onto another population of neurons, which in this is, it, which is represented by a matrix. Um, and each hard location contributes the average of its multiset, right? And the word in register, you'll notice that the addresses are, uh, that the word in is different from the address. Um, that's for a hetero associative memory, which I'll talk about in just a second. But if it's the same address, uh, then this, this will be fed in here as well. And then it'll increment the counters at the locations where you have a one here and a one here. Uh, and that in that way, the uh, sort of the sums stored at each hard location will represent the average of their own multiset. And you can average all these multisets uh, by taking sort of the vertical average. And then out comes uh, sort of your word out, which is the, the output of your memory. Okay, so this gets back to the to the main uh, 
so back to the, the front page of the book, and that's that this memory is not actually just a, you know, a one-shot memory. You don't put in an image and then recover the, the image immediately. Instead, it's a dynamical system in which you continuously keep reading and iterating on your memory. Uh, so notice that the output space is the same thousand bits as the address register, which is thousand bits. So you put something in, goes through this process, comes out on the other side, and then you plug that back in. So what will that do for you? Um, it, there's, there then is this concept of a critical distance. So this critical distance is given by this circle here. And if you're outside the critical distance, in which case the, in, in the numbers in the book, it comes out to 209 bits, you do not converge if you're outside this critical distance. So you, you do one hop and you're farther away, another hop and you're farther away, another hop, another hop, another hop, and you end up just going randomly throughout the space, right? Because you did not converge. Um, and then if you're within the critical distance circle, then with each iteration, you will get closer and closer and closer and closer to the target, right? So if you start out with something with noise, maybe like a, a zero here with a lot of noise, one iteration will get you down to like 6% noise, and then another iteration will get you down to 2% noise. And then once you get to the center, you will just continue to uh, just uh, loop back to the center. And that's how you know you've converged, just because you're, you're getting the same thing over and over again. Um, now, this was sort of the big surprising uh, sort of, one, I'd say one of the biggest and most surprising uh, sort of concepts that was talked about in the book is the rates of convergence and divergence. Um, and so convergence here happens in something like five, six iterations, but at, just about as a rule, it converges in like less than 10 iterations um, for you know, reasonable choices of, of numbers um, in terms of the card locations and address space. Um, and so it's extremely fast versus divergence. Divergence is slow. And when I say slow, I mean very slow. This chain will continue to bounce around the space randomly for about 10 to the power of 50 iterations. So that's like a huge difference. It's like a, a difference in 10 to the 49, 49 orders of magnitude. Um, that's pretty slow. <laughs> it's really slow. You cannot, you cannot wait for that. The universe will explode. Um, <laughs> so uh, the, the thing that I liked about this was that it, it kind of related back to the natural phenomenon of knowing how you know something. So it's the, he maps that onto starting within the critical distance. So if you start within the critical distance, then you'll know that you know by iterating to convergence and getting there quickly. But if you iterate from a random location where you're not converging, you will know that you're not converging after you know, only 10 iterations. So that's why he claims you can know that you know something. And if you don't know, you're not going to claim to know it because of the random firing of, of neurons in your brain because they're not converging. Um, and then it also explains sort of the tip of the tongue phenomenon, where if you're starting the critical distance, if you just happen to be 209 bits away and you iterate and you go to another space on this, on this circle, uh, you'll continue to iterate and hit different points on this circle until at one point, by random chance, you will end up either inside or outside. So you'll be on the tip of your tongue for a while for several iter iterations until it either converges extremely quickly or you'll forget it and not know exactly what's happening. Uh, you'll forget what you were trying to say. <laughs> um, and if you, uh, another, another sort of natural phenomenon he argues is that if you rehearse something a lot of times, if you practice it a bunch, then it increases the signal strength and that's the critical distance because uh, you're storing the same pattern and uh, a bunch of different neurons around. And so that all the multi-sets of, of uh, hard locations that are close to what you want to actually recover become sort of saturated with the actual data that you want to recover. And thus it increases the critical distance. Uh, so then it's easier to recall. Yeah, I've forgotten this uh, aspect of, you know, I've thought about this a long time. And I'm just wondering if that, those intuitions about the rates of convergence and divergence still apply in the kind of work we do. Um, it's, it's not at all obvious to me. I'm just curious if anyone has thoughts on that. I mean, that, he's, he's relating this to, to uh, you know, psychological phenomena, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the question is, I don't think this is how, these type of memories he's creating are not the kind of memories in our brain. Um, but are these properties that properties would apply to the kind of memories that we do think are in the brain than the kind of memories that we're modeling? Um, I, I have zero intuition on that. So I'm just um, Well, most of our stuff doesn't have any iteration. It's just sort of instant, one step. 
Yeah. Um, the place where we've had iteration has been like in the voting process where we narrow down a set of unions. But I think that's a very different type of convergence than this. Mm. Uh, I mean, because that's that is in in the voting that is where you would actually see this the tip of the you know, tongue phenomenon, if you want yeah. to call it that. But it's, it's like, like this type of convergence, though. It's sort of reducing ambiguity over time, whereas whereas this is sort of filling. You're not getting any new information here. You're just trying to fill in a pattern that you mm. one single pattern that you have. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I won't read too much into it then. Yeah, I don't know if some of the other work has. Had some uh, these properties on up and yeah, I mean, I think I forgot about this because I didn't find it useful. Um, <laughs> but maybe not. I don't remember. But it's interesting. So it's uh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So I'll briefly touch on prediction. This is one of those things that he goes on in much more detail than I'm going to give uh, here. But the idea is that instead of storing the data at its own address, um, you store data that's different from the address. So at a certain address, you write another piece of data. Um, so maybe if you wanted to store you know, the sequence of natural numbers, you take your image of a one, and at that address corresponding to that image, you store a two, something like that. And you store uh, a bunch of different transitions. So you can store the transition from a one to a two, or you can store the transition from a one to a three and do a two two step transition. Uh, you can also do multiple orders of, of transitions. So you can say, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, uh, store a, a, B and C and then have that be followed by a D. Um, so yeah, the idea is that you can store, um, you know, various types of transitions. And then when you, when you want to uh, use your sequence memory, uh, it, it operates in a very similar way. So this took me a little bit to understand like why this was the case, uh, but I promise this works. Um, but if you're trying to recall a chain of first order transitions from memory, then if you are reading, let's say you're at address A1 and address A1 points to A2, right? So this, this red dot at A2 means that the data in this, sort, uh, in this circle points to A2. Then if you start out within the critical distance, you're not going to converge within this circle because it's pointing somewhere else. But as a rule, if you're within the critical distance, the new address that you go to will be more similar to the data written at that address than the original address was similar to its corresponding piece of data. So that was kind of a mouthful, but it's best demonstrated by this picture that as you iterate, you get closer and closer to the actual sequence or the actual data um, and, and address pointers at each part of the sequence over time. And so the sort of convergence rule still, still stands. Um, if you're doing this, you don't have the same sort of tip of the tongue phenomena and, uh, and the sort of knowing how you know, because that would require sort of the, you, you'd have to know that you're not changing, but if you're operating well, then you're, if this chain is operating correctly, it's going to be changing continuously so you'd have to have another sort of attractor for each one of these to say, not only do I know where I'm going in the next part of the sequence, but I recognize this part of the sequence, something like that. So you'd have to store both like the part of the sequence in your memory and the next step. Now, the big problem with this memory is it's first order, right? I yeah. Mean, so it doesn't really solve the hard problems of sequence memory. Um, yeah, I will say I am leaving out a lot. So. I mentioned that there were other, there, you can go to higher orders. Um, I mean, I'm not gonna lie. I like Juventus approach better. <laughs> I'm not I'm not gonna argue for this uh, over like the HTM ideas, but uh, there are sort of arguments proposed that you can store all the transitions you need to be able to tackle the complex problems of like seeing the ABC versus like, or like ABCD versus- so Are those in this book or those are your solving yeah, research? Yeah, those, those are in the book. Really? Yeah, I, I left it out for brevity. maybe for some reason I didn't find compelling, so I forgot about it. Yeah. Um, okay, so this slide I might butcher a little bit, but uh, so this this is what uh, he argues is kind of the connection to biology and sort of this grand miracle. Um, and the 
and, and so this is taking place in the cerebellar cortex. And I think, I'm not actually sure of the order in which this happened, but I think Kinerva came up with this model and then was alerted as to this particular structure and then sort of mapped this model onto the structure. Um, but the, the, the point that uh, sort of was, was the big coincidence was that you have parallel fibers running along uh, another axon, right? So you have, you have like one neuron and its axon extends and you have another set of fibers that exactly wraps one to one on, this, uh, on these larger neurons. I think they're Purkinje cells. I have some notes here. Um, Coincidence of the climbing fibers with the dendrites of the Purkinje cells. Yeah, so that's, that's why he thinks that this, uh, this model would be realistic because you have to have that exact structure where you have an input line and an output line sort of connected um, because you can't use the same line for both. You have to have a corresponding input and output line for each activation uh, or for each like sort of word output at, uh, for the hard location contents matrix. So this is describing, this, this picture is like, here's the matrix representation. Here's the representation as counters and, and sums. And then here's the representation as a biological neuron where you have to have synapses that are like tightly tied for each of the content matrix locations. Um, so that, that's kind of like the biological motivation. Uh, I'm not sure. Other people on this call probably know a lot more about, about this than I do. Um, but I thought it was well, an interesting idea. Yeah, of course, you know, we're talking about the cerebellum. And um, the cerebellum has a very simple structure compared to the neocortex. Mm -hmm. And independently, three different researchers looked at that simple structure and deduced or, uh, a potential memory function in it. And it turned out to be pretty much the same. This was all back in the 1980 timeframe. Um, and so, um, and so, you know, the, it, it is a simple type of memory structure. Uh, there's more neurons in the cerebellum than there are in the neocortex. But on, it, it, I've always pointed out, and maybe some of you don't know this, but you, you can be a pretty normal person without a cerebellum. Um, you, you know, you have certain deficits, but they're not, they're not really cognitive deficits. There are behavioral deficits, like you, it's hard if you to, you have to concentrate really hard on things you're doing, uh, as opposed to doing them fluidly. Um, so, so it's some of these principles that might actually apply in the cerebellum, but they, they, you know, were, were biased and, and they don't really necessarily apply the same way in the cortex. Um, so I just, I think that's worth just pointing that out. So it's not like, hey, this is, could be wrong. It might be right, or could be related, be, be more likely to be right. Um, but it, again, it's, it's dealing with an organ in the brain that um, is not critical for intelligence in some ways. Um, Jeff, do you mean if you remove the cerebellum, the cortex learns how to perform those functions? Or if no, no, it's more, okay. It's, it's what happens is the following. Like it's kind of memories we think about everyday memories are not stored in the cerebellum. Um, the cerebellum is, is sort of an intermediary to uh, fine motor control. So people with cerebellar de deficits, um, have, they may, for example, if you're gonna pick up a coffee cup, you and I could be looking at the screen and just move our hand over and grab the coffee cup and not have to think about it. They would have to, if you didn't have a, if you have a damaged cerebellum or don't have one, you'd have to think about picking up the coffee cup. You'd have to take your attention away from the screen and look at the coffee cup and okay, I'm gonna pick up the coffee cup. <laughs> uh, it's that kind of deficit. It, it, it's lots of subtle deficits, but that it's that kind of deficit. So it's not like, uh, I don't know if the cortex can pick it up. It's just that people learn to compensate. So I've, I've mentioned this many times. I have a friend who does not have most of her cerebellum. She lost it because it was removed because uh, you have tumor in it. And she's pretty normal. And, but she'll tell you, oh yeah, I have to think about everything a little bit. I can't, she says, her example is I can't multitask. And, and, but she's learned to compensate it. So if you met her, you wouldn't know if there's anything wrong with it. Um, she's a little bit maybe slower to talk about things or a little bit, you know, not, not slow in, in a deficit, just physically slower. And she's a little bit thinks about a lot more things. Um, anyway, so that's what I meant by it's, it's not really necessary. You, you, it, it sort of fills in all these little low-level motor behaviors and other things. But, um, 
after she lost the cerebellum, did it take a while for her to adapt? Yeah, it, it, I wasn't. I didn't know her at that time, um, but she she told me it took it took a little while. But again, it, it wasn't like she lost memories or anything like that. It's it's none of the stuff we think about of the cognitive functions of, of high level thought and intelligence are happening there. These are these are things related to reflex behaviors and fine motor control and. Um, you can think of it sort of like a, I don't want to oversimplify, but you can think of it as like a smoothing function for uh, highly learned behaviors um, and that, that are controlled and some reflex behaviors like rabbits. When you, when you puff an air, you puff an air, uh, air puff into their eyes, their the eyes blink. And um, that blink reflex is slowered, slowed if, if you damage their cell bellum. It's, it, you know, it's, it doesn't work as well, that kind of stuff. Got it. Thanks. Okay. Uh, moving on. Let's see. Oh yeah, here's my slide on our our uh, our main points of concern with this. Um, yeah, basically, I'm just saying we want to go from the dense vectors to a sparse distributed representation, which is much more realistic. Um, so there are some proposals that sort of uh, try to alleviate this. Slightly. This isn't exactly that, but this is a step in the right direction. This is the selected coordinate design. This is some follow-up work um, where instead of having each neuron pay attention to all the bits in the address and have what, what, wait, what year is this? I'm sorry. Uh, ooh, I don't know. Was it I recent? No, I don't think it's recent. I think it's <laughs> what recent like, for you? <laughs> no, like <laughs> like two thousands. Uh, don't quote me on that. <laughs> okay, that's recent in my mind. Ninety okay. thousand. <laughs> Um, yeah, so then instead of having, yeah, each neuron pay attention to all the bits in the address, it just checks for equality and says, is this, is the bit at this address equal to zero? Is the bit at this address equal to one? Is it equal to zero? And you sum, and then you say, is it equal to three, right? So it is exactly, it, it, it checks for exact sort of sparse I mean, yeah, sort of like sparse subsets of the address space and checks to make sure that it, it matches with its address. Now, the problem with this so is the, that- So the assumption is that the address is still fundamentally dense, but you're just subsampling from it. Yep. Um, yeah. To do a match, okay. Right. So yeah, as I said, it's not, it's not fully there, but it's a step to, towards more sparsity. Um, and so uh, there, there's also some, some interesting, there's a follow-up paper on this paper uh, by the same guy, and he points out you can interpolate between the two designs. So you can have this this regime where the neuron pays attention to all of them and has a certain threshold, which corresponds to a radius. Uh, or you can you can have uh, th this this is the other side of the spectrum where you have a neuron that pays attention to just a very sparse subset, and it has to have all of them activated. You can go anywhere in between and sort of dynamically adapt your your model. To have address neurons that are activated by, you know, uh, various uh, various size subsets of the address space, and then also those can have thresholds in and of themselves. Um, so, let's see what size is this. Oh yes, this is my my proposal is that you actually use the sparse addresses. Um, so instead of uh, having dense addresses, this is this is uh, using sparse addresses. Use a selected coordinate design where you're only paying attention to specific. Uh, sort of addresses, and you're only testing for ones, right? So you're only testing for activations. Um, and then instead of looking at inequality, you also have a threshold. So this is the idea of sort of the, the sparse distributed representation and overlap. Uh, so this this neuron would have maybe an address that looked like like this vector of just uh, you know three ones. Um, you could even make that more complex and have dendrites where you have a sparse address and the neuron pays attention to separate subsets. Each neuron has multiple subsets with thresholds in and of themselves. And then you check if any of the dendrites are active. Um, th this is just this is just a, a random proposal, but uh, I believe that this would this would still work um, as long as long as you have sort of the right proportion of hard locations being activated. Uh, I don't see why this wouldn't work. I'm not exactly sure how this would change the memory model. I don't know how like the sort of the uh, oh yeah, I should I should elaborate on this table here. Um, the reason why this design was supposedly better than the original design was that the 
overlap of hard locations is closer for sort of close address is higher for close addresses and lower for far addresses. So what that means is that when you're reading, you're going to get more again more signal because you're reading from more relevant hard locations and less noise because you're reading from less farther away locations. So I don't know how how this idea would affect that. Um, could, but, could I ask you to go back to that first slide with uh, Jekyll's work? Yeah. So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking each on that address, each line, each bit of that address is a represents an axon within some uh, close radius of this neuron. And then it chooses to synapse with a subset of those axons that are available to it locally. Yep. Um, so in, in the sense that, you know, if we think of that the entire memory has to be represented by one continuous vector, yeah, that's unrealistic. But if you think that, you know, um, locally, there are these dense potential vectors they're only realized when you actually synapse, you know, to the respective uh, axons that are available to it for whatever reason. Uh, doesn't that kind of? I mean, I, I understand when you extend it to dendrites, you can you can get you know sub functioning it, but that that seems more biologically plausible than than the uh, uh, in 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 that sense to me. Um, I'm just waiting for. Uh, um, criticism to fly out from uh, the older members at Numendo for this, but that looks implementable and plausible to me. Well, it's, I'm confused about this a bit. So, I mean, your addresses, you're, you're connecting to zeros and ones in this case, is that? Uh, well, it's, this, this could be, I, I'm just looking at uh, uh, the zeros and ones as being whether the axon is currently activated or not. In other words, there's there's a thousand axons, you know, embedded in. I'm, I'm just saying, say one cubic millimeter that this neuron happens to have as its local neighborhood, and basically uh, has synapses to only a subset of those things. And at that time, uh, some of them might. Uh, well, the question is, are those some of the axons? Uh, what I'm confused about this is that in in our models and in the brain, the way this works is. You don't form synapses um, to things that, as randomly and then pick out which ones are useful. Um, uh, th there's some exceptions to this, but but the general idea is you're going to connect to the. You, you have a pattern in, in memory that you're trying to recognize, right? And that pattern is existing over maybe millions of neurons, but it's a sparse pattern of activation, and so there may be you know a few hundred or a few thousand neurons that are active. Uh, and and you form and you want to recognize that pattern. You could, you only have to form 20, 30 synapses to uh, to active cells in that pattern, um, and that's all you need right. to recognize the larger pattern over a million neurons. And right. And so I, in this case, so, I'm not sure they're doing the same thing. Or are these are these you know, are you pick? I, I'm I'm lost at this point. Honestly, is about like those blue lines are those like. Are those are just synapses. Are they synapsing randomly on, on, on axons or are they synapsing only on particular axons for a particular pattern? Yeah, no, they're, uh, those are random. Um, each, each neuron selects a random subset of, uh, you know, from the original paper, it was 10 coordinates out of a thousand dimensional address. So you select wow. a random subset and that address is to exactly match. Um, what the neuron. Yeah. Is. Yeah. So I, I, I guess so, again, so, so again, but, the, but, but but they don't have to be random. They could have been learned. Yes. I mean, we're not yeah. looking at the mechanism for learning. We're saying, I'm just looking at the topology of the thing. Well, if you, if they learn, then we're getting closer to what we're talking about in, in the brain and our models, right? I mean, although there'd still be yeah, uh, that's, until, it's, it's very sparse patterns. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I think it kind of, kind of matches. It's, it's just, when, when we started out the math, we assumed that the entire memory had to be represented with this one dense vector, but you could have, you know, smaller vectors that just represent what your local neighborhood of potential axons are. No, I, I think it's form. fundamentally different. It's sort of what I said in the beginning. Here, the assumption is still that there is a, the the 
the basic address is still a dense address and it's trying to look at efficient ways of matching to that underlying dense address. That's what this is trying to do. That's not what well the way it is in the brain. It, there's, it's fundamentally a sparse address to begin with. Um, and it subsamples from that. It's a pretty big difference. What, 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 make, what makes it sparse given the density of axons that are going all over the place? In your yeah. mind, what makes that dense, uh, sparse? Well, well, the activity is sparse. The activity, the activity is sparse. Is sparse. Yeah, no, ac activity is is whether those things are ones or zeros. It's it's not whether they're you know the number of locations. The number of locations should I think, at least in the way I'm looking at this, represents the possible accessible axons that are available in your local neighborhood. Well, I, I guess the question is, I'm this confused. address is still shown as being uh, is still shown as being dense. Right, so yeah. I'm not sure where this, we're talking about the sparsity here. When you have in a dense address like this, almost almost all the desirable properties we, we get from SDR aren't there. Um, uh, I, I, we, could, we could try to walk through them again, but but um, in some sense, in a dense address, every bit is equally valid as every other bit, and um, you know the zeros are as important as the ones you know, in some sense. So well, I, I just it's fundamentally different. Well, it's, I don't, it's it's it's. Well, you say that they're the equally valid, but it's it, it's only the only valid ones in this particular case for that neuron is what it happens to synapse to. I mean, that's that's that's. No, but where's know, the information? What this, uh, so, what this figure is showing, if I understand correctly, is there's really nothing about neurons here. Um, I mean, I know the word neuron is up there, but this is just a subsampling operation. You have an original address that's dense, and and if he's saying an efficient way to match that dense address rather than storing all thousand of them is to store, let's say three of them randomly subsample and to match it, you have to say, okay, if I happen to connect, if one of my samples from the original dense address was zero, then it has to be as my new query vector has to have a zero in that location in order to match. And that's what this equals zero is, is showing. And correct me if I'm I wrong, see. Alex. So, yeah. so okay. here you have to, in order to match that okay. address, you, so it's, you're, it's, you're it's, it's, you're it's totally matching a subset component. of the pattern. Mm -hmm. It's it's just matching a subset of pattern. It doesn't make any distinction between ones and zeros. It has to be an identical match to that subsample. And that's what that equals three so, is. So, so, that's all it is. It's a, just a so mathematical I, operation. There's nothing about axons or anything here. Mm. Uh, it's just a purely no, I, I mathematical that, okay. step. But what I'm looking at here is if those equal zeros were all replaced with equal ones. Be the same. What do you mean? I, I just don't see how, why that's not what uh, a, a synapse to, to, a, uh, to an axon would. Uh, would, would it is, uh, that's the way our, our stuff works. That's not what was being shown in the previous. Slide. I guess one way to look at it, let's say I have 10,000 neurons and they can have a sparse activation or a dense activation. If I connect to 20, I have a, activated a pattern in those, uh, in those 10,000 neurons. And if I connect to 20 synapse, 20 of those active, 20 of those active um, neurons um, in a sparse activation, those 20 active neurons will be almost absolute guaranteed to, I, I recognize this pattern. It'll be highly noise immunity, high noise immunity noise. If I connect to 20 active, even active neurons in a dense population, uh, there's very little information in that. And I can't recognize the pattern reliably. Um, it, it's, it relies on the sparsity for doing that. So I think they're very, uh, it's, it, it's, it, when you're dealing with a dense, you know, maybe Alex is gonna talk about sparse one stuff right now, um, but I think when you're dealing with the dense stuff, it's just not at all equivalent. It's just really very different world. It seems to me, unless you know, disagree, but I don't know. It seems that way to me. Yeah, I mean, I I, I certainly agree. I think, um, yeah, I, I I again, I'll reiterate my my main concern with the paper or the original book was the dense addresses. Um, so that immediately because I'd already read the sort of Nementia stuff, and I was like, oh yeah, well, SDR seems to be the way that things work. Um, but so yeah, the one of the reasons I'm highlighting this is because. Yeah, basically, yeah, th this is just to introduce the subsampling operation uh, and to say that you don't need dense connectivity between all the neurons, all the address neurons and all the, uh, yeah, between the address and, and all the address neurons. Um, 
you can, you can have weights that only connect to a subset of the of the address. Um, that's what this is supposed to do. But yeah, the, the, I I haven't seen. I, I can't say that there isn't something that already does this. But this this is more in line with the SDR proposal. Um, there might be something out there that that uses SDRs for for SDM, um, and those are two different types of sparsity. Um, but yeah, this this. And how how is this different from SDRs? I'm not. Is this, this exactly is, SDRs? Or? This is exactly SDRs. This is exactly okay. SDRs, but. Uh, like what I'm saying, yeah, the reason uh, I'm introducing this is because I'm saying you can use SDRs as this, this part. This part here can be SDRs. Uh, so in comes an SDR, it activates some hard locations. Maybe you, instead of using the, uh, the summation, uh, you might have to do some, some, uh, some unions or uh, some intersections maybe change up the operations happening here and then out comes another SDR. But like, I actually haven't given too much thought in mapping them together, but I, I believe it's possible to replace all the dense parts of this with sparse distributed representations. So the activations of these hard locations are going to be sparse. Uh, actually they are, they're going to be even more sparse, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah. That that's that's kind of where I was going with this. So this, I suppose you could think about um, sparse, our kind of sparsity. You can say, okay, well, instead of representing an address space of two to the n, we have, um, you know, we have a, a binomial like, uh, you know, you choosing, you know, twenty bits out of, you know, thousand choose twenty type of thing, mm -hmm. which is still extremely large space, but it's much much smaller than two to the n. Right, so you could think of a sparse activation. Say, okay, we're going to have ten thousand neurons. If two hundred are active, two percent, um, and each that represents a memory a memory space, and each of those is sort of an address. I guess you could call it that way. And then you could say, well, we're not going to populate all those spaces. Um, so I'm I'm mentally trying to map the two together. Right, you could say, yeah, well, the sparse distributed address is is, is it's a smaller address space than two to the n, but um, and then they'll have different properties. And, you know, I guess you could try to make that connection. I'm not sure um, the advantages of doing that, but but one could think of it that way, I guess. I mean, the properties of that are kind of, we've laid it out in our- oh, Yeah, yeah. In yeah. It, it, it's sort of making the mapping to Kanerva's world. That's the piece, you know, I haven't done explicitly, but yeah. in terms of the properties of this particular formalism, I think we understand that. Yeah, well. we did, right. And you yeah. did you did a lot of that. In, 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 yeah, and that so the was quantifying so, this. Yeah. yeah, I guess we never we never felt the need to go back and say, hey, this is like Kinerva's thing, because in some ways, um, I mean, although we did cite his work, because it's- Oh yeah, yeah, we cited yeah. them. I mean, yeah. I think, like I, yeah, the intuitions, I think were really- important. Yeah, I, but I think where we didn't want to cite, we didn't really get intuitions from is this concept of his, these memory operations that he's talking about. Um, we don't, we, we yeah, don't, I didn't try to create a formal equivalent. Yeah. Well, we didn't rely SDRs on it. We, don't, yeah, we didn't try. It wasn't really inspirational in that regard. At least I didn't find it. But it took, it took me a while to realize, not that long, but it took me a little while to realize, oh, I want to reject a, a lot of what Penty's doing in that book. Not because it's bad. It's, it's really great work. But I want to reject it because I didn't think it's, really, it's not what's going on in the brain. So, But there's parts that are very useful. And um, so at some point you, you want to stop trying to make the connections because it's just becomes a pedantic exercise. Um, um, just one quick just, note. I think we've been over an hour now, um, quite a yeah. bit over an hour. Uh, how much more do you have, Alex? I think this was like, this was the last slide. Yeah, I'll, I'll just quickly mention this. Um, yeah, the other, the other problem that I had was that these the neurons are chosen to be randomly distributed throughout the space. Um, so you have your population neurons and you say, okay, go. They're going to be random, randomly distributed, and they don't change their addresses, right? Once you have a neuron that's fixed weights, it's going to be fixed at that address. Um, but there is some additional follow-up work in which I think the neurons can, I, I haven't looked too much into this, but I believe uh, this is what uh, the adaptive design is doing, in, in which the, the neurons and their sort of uh, access circles move around the space so that they cluster around inputs that are sort of, if you have a, if you're writing a bunch of stuff that you need to distinguish between in one part of the input space, it's not uniform throughout the entire input space, um, which would certainly be, be the case, I think, in the sparse distributed addresses 
scenario, then yeah, these, these neurons cluster where they're supposed to cluster to represent that part of the space better. So I like this because it's, it's the idea of kind of learning a basis. Uh, it, it's, it's very similar to learning a basis to represent a space. You wanna, That's what we do in the spatial pooler, right? It's the yeah, same yeah, basic idea. it's exactly the same. That's why I put this picture of the spatial pooler here. And uh, the I, spatial I didn't, pooler, I didn't see that. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, the spatial pooler starts at random and it works like a little bit um, and you get you know similar inputs, similar outputs from the random spatial pooler, but until you turn on the your boosting um, and the learning in the spatial pooler, that's when you get like uh, a really good representation of the input space. So the same thing can be applied to SDM. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, I'll, I'll just briefly mention this. I have, uh, I have a friend who's working on a, a, a very interesting thesis that relates SDM to modern machine learning, but I can't really talk about it uh, because it's not published yet, but I would like to talk about that in the future. That's it. Cool. Thank you. Yep. I mean, some of the people in this meeting will know that pendy has gone in sort of different directions with this in terms of his, I forget what, what's his research called this. Um, he's doing these semantic operations. Uh, vector symbolic so, architecture. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is he's going even further away from the biology in my regard, but it's interesting work. Um, um, but he, he's, he has not sort of followed our, our path, which is more the biology type of stuff. Yeah. The vector symbolic architecture stuff, yeah, I, it, yeah, it's it's definitely further away from biology, but it is insanely interesting for for those people that are interested in. It's all it also just completely uh, takes advantage of the, the high dimensional vector. Yeah, but again, it, it takes advantage of the, in the intense um, methods. Yeah. yeah. Great. Could you kick out that reference to to Keeler? I'm I'm unfamiliar with that one. Oh yeah, I'll I'll have to. I'll, I'll send that in the Slack. I'll update that. Thank you. All right.